Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Vietnam War, Lessons Learned, Lessons Ignored. We think this is a really fitting show for today since April 30th, exactly today, marks the 43rd uh, year since the government of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese government, collapsed. And our, our guest today is a really well-qualified uh, person to speak on this subject, Ambassador Ray Burkhardt. Ambassador Burkhardt has often been on Asian Review, uh, and at those times often to speak about Taiwan, where he served, also served and was the chairman of the American Institute in Taiwan. But today, we're going to draw on his expertise uh, related to Vietnam, where he served, interestingly enough, his first tour in the Foreign Service and his last tour as ambassador. Welcome back to Asian Review. Thanks, Bill. Great to be here. Great to be here, to have you. Well. Um, Wow, there's so many lessons from the Vietnam War. Uh, and as the title suggests, some were learned and some were ignored. But uh, what yeah. do you think are some of the great lessons? What is, from, based on your experience, what are some of the great lessons of the Vietnam War? I think my personal experience, having sure. spent more than five years in Vietnam and with a big gap in between, mm -hmm. um, I actually went back in the middle at one point, too, as part of the, to, in, a, in a negotiating team to sort of begin the process of normalization. I think one, one lesson is, if you're going to get involved in a civil war, be really sure that the side that you're helping has popular support. Mm -hmm. Be sure that it has a political base, because uh, the government in Saigon did not. It was really a house of cards and uh, very weak support. They were, um, and was fighting against a, uh, a well-trained, well-organized Vietnamese Communist Party. And so that made it very difficult. It, made, it really made it uh, almost a hopeless cause from the beginning, in, in my view. That's, that, that, that would be one, one lesson uh, that and one uh, and, and it was the way most of us who were young people there, young guys who spoke Vietnamese, were working in the embassy, were out in the field, or working on the uh, provincial advisory teams, as I did before I went into the embassy. Um, we had this sense, really, very soon after we got there, that, uh, wow, these are, these are great people, and um, they deserve a lot better than this crappy government that they have here. Wow, let's pick up a couple of those points. You mentioned the lack of support, the lack of popular support for the government. Yeah. And, and, I, and um, in my view, too, it was, maybe that means the same thing, but there's a lack of political stability. They, they were never quite sure who's going to be the government today or tomorrow. All the generals were fighting amongst right. themselves. And, and how, how can you successfully wage a war in those circumstances? Actually, the period that I was there, which was very late in the war, I was there from 1970 to 1973. Mm -hmm. In that period, this sort of revolving door governments that, that they had with the generals, right. that had ended. Mm -hmm. And Wing Van Thieu was the president the whole time I was there and until the bitter end in 1975. So mm -hmm. uh, it was stable in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I should say another aspect of all this, before we start blaming the South Vietnamese government for everything, was that the, uh, the communists very deliberately um, killed off, assassinated political figures who did have popular support and who could have posed a, uh, a challenge. Mm. Why, why was it that the, that the communists, the, the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, were so much better in motivating and mobilizing the people of Vietnam? Well, in the North, of course, they had been in, in, in power for a long time and right. had established a Leninist political system in which people were not aware of anything else except the Communist Party. And that was, um, you know, worked well for the leadership in the North. In the South, uh, I, I would say the, North, the, the, the Communists had the advantage of attack that a, that a, that a guerrilla group has, uh, of stealth, of secrecy, 
Uh, in fact, of course, the 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 the, the infrastructure of the uh, of the Viet Cong in the South was very much weakened by the Tet Offensive, mm -hmm. and in the end, the victory really was of the main force units coming down from the north. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I personally got to Vietnam just after the Tet Offensive, and at that time, everybody thought, "Well, the war's won; it's all over. It's just a matter of mopping up a few odds and ends, and we're done." <laughs> yeah. Wow, <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> well, I mean, there was a period, um, I got there in October 1970, mm -hmm. and there was a period during the late 1970 all through 71 when um, the situation actually looked pretty stable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would drive all over the country. Mm. I mean, there were places you knew you couldn't drive, right? but I, you could certainly drive south into the Mekong Delta, and uh, quite a bit of the area of three core uh, out to Tain In and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you could go safely in, in those those areas. I mean, much more so than people in similar kind of jobs today in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. so. And then in 72, there was a, a new offensive. And uh, things were less stable from then on. Wow. Um... Do you think the Vietnam War was the biggest historic event of your lifetime? Um, well, it was, as a personal experience, it mm -hmm. was a big event. And going back as ambassador was quite fascinating. As I, we chatted before, I ran into people who I had met or known during the war and realized that they'd been on the other side all along. That was interesting. This is the mystery uh, of the yeah, Vietnam but, War. But, well, it's, uh, it was very enigmatic. but. Um, I mean, look, the biggest event uh, for a foreign policy person, the biggest event really was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. which I think in some ways brings me to another sort of lesson from the, war, from the Vietnam War, which is the very simple lesson that we can't predict, uh, we can't perfectly predict the future. And the way things turned out in Vietnam was something really unimaginable in the sense that uh, the, the Cold War ended in 1991. The Vietnamese, being very pragmatic people, uh, even under a Leninist communist government, they reoriented, reoriented themselves. They established relations with all their neighbors. We established relations with them. Uh, they made clear that they were pretty fed up with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, Vietnam may be the most uh, pro-U.S. Um, pro country in Southeast Asia. You so, know, I mean, there, there's an extraordinary outcome. The relationship is a very good one. Right. And uh, it improved a lot during the time I was there because the Vietnamese were ready to improve it. And, then it, and, it, and on that process has kept going under my successors. Uh, we could, we didn't, we didn't, so. Part of one of the lessons is you don't you don't you can't you can't perfectly predict what's going to happen and what it's, what the situation is going to look like twenty years from now or thirty years from now. I, I remember being in Vietnam. Uh, I went back in two thousand. I haven't been back since. But um, talking to a lot of young Vietnamese, mm -hmm. and I had mentioned, well, I was here during the war, and they go, the what? <laughs> I said, the, well, the war. You know, the uh, Vietnam, the American War. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and then they want to switch the subject. Tell me what MTV in America is really yeah. like. <laughs> no, Vietnam's a very young country. Right. And the majority of the people, I think the great majority by this point, were born after the war ended. Right. They're not really interested in talking about the war. Neither are the uh, most of their, of their elders. Uh, I mean, in the, two, in the three years I was there as ambassador, there were only twice that there were incidents in which people were clearly bitter and mm. expressed bitterness toward me. Mm. And they came from opposite directions. One was when I went with, um, with uh, then uh, SINGPAC commander Denny Blair mm -hmm. to a village to watch excavation to remove uh, a plane where mm -hmm. an American pilot had crashed. And um, there, as we approached the village, uh, two old guys sort of glared at us and one said, uh, uh, haven't you killed enough people here? You wanted to come, you could come back and kill some more? And I understood the Vietnamese, so I unfortunately had to translate that for Admiral Blair. Mm 
But um, then the other one was, came in the other direction. It was in Saigon uh, during a function of some kind. A guy came up to me and said, you deserted us. Mm. You left us to this uh, terrible situation we have to live with every day. Mm. I remember President um, Wing Van Tu always um, saying that um, the same thing. America deserted us. They should have dropped a nuclear wet bomb. <laughs> And I, I was really holding out for that. As yeah, well, that, um, I don't think we ever promised that. Um, we, did, we did fail to deliver on what the Vietnamese had rightly understood we were going to do uh, after the Paris Peace Agreement mm -hmm. was signed in 1973. Mm -hmm. um, they had a right to expect that if there was a, an invasion like the one that happened, that we would give them support maybe air support and provide uh, material and so forth, and uh, we didn't do that. Uh, Henry Kissinger sometimes is implicated as being the one behind that abandonment of American responsibility. Um, I'd have to go back and look at all that history. Actually, my recollection is it was the Democrats in Congress, mm -hmm. more, more than the administration. It was mm -hmm. the Ford administration at that okay. point. That, that's, I, I would, I, that's, I believe that's the case. Um, I think where the re people put responsibility on Kissinger is for the Paris Peace Agreement, mm -hmm. which um, was controversial at the time. A lot of people saw it as a, uh, as a sellout. Uh, the, 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 it was opposed by the two government, and it was opposed. I was there when all this was being negotiated. Oh, you were in Paris at this time? No, in, in, in oh, Vietnam. Vietnam. In Vietnam. Okay. It was opposed by uh, President Tu because uh, well, the, main, the main weakness from the point of view of the South Vietnamese government was that it left Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese units and communist units in place. Mm. Uh, they weren't withdrawn. That was, um, that was seen as, as pretty shocking, mm. understandably so, by the, uh, by the South Vietnamese uh, government. Mm. The U.S. government had lots of policies that it trotted out and tried to um, stabilize the situation in Vietnam. One, they put a lot of strength on, uh, a lot of emphasis on, was the Strategic Hamlet Program. Did you have anything to do? That was early on. That was very early. That was very early on. I mean, that was uh, not part of the part of the jargon <laughs> when I was there. Okay. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was even during the during the ZM period, in the, right, the early right, '60s and right. mid '60s. And so. that motivated a lot of ill feeling towards Zim. Yeah, it was apparently it, it was um, it was not a success. Right, and I, as I recall, that idea was also tried by the French, and it was also copied from the British practice in Malaysia. Um, I'm not sure about the British practice. The British practice in Malaysia, where there was this General Thompson, mm -hmm. who was considered to have been the most successful person at carrying out guerrilla warfare mm -hmm. in, in, during that era, that was more what sort of we, we copied later on mm. in um, sort of you know, development work that was done in some of these provinces and organizing. Uh, the uh, regular forces and the popular forces, right. which were militia forces, right. you know, uh, you know, and some of that had success for a while. Uh, one of the great problems in, in, in the war was the was the terrible corruption uh, of a lot of the generals and so forth. Let's not all, not all. There were some great South Vietnamese generals and very honorable ones, okay. but not enough. Let's stop right there, because that's, that's an interesting topic, and we want to pick that up when we come back. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Ambassador Raymond Burkhart. We, this is the 43rd, should we call it, anniversary of the um, capitulation of the South Vietnamese government. So we're reflecting on that experience and lessons learned and possibly lessons ignored, and we'll be right back. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland, on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity 
and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Welcome back to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, uh, Vietnam War, Lessons Learned, Lessons Ignored. And our guest is Ambassador Ray Burkhardt, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam. Just before the break, we were talking a bit about the level of corruption in South Vietnam. So we want to finish that off and then move on to other topics. So we'll let you pick it up from where we left off. Uh, you were also talking about the fact that um, a lot of the Vietnamese high command was somewhat maligned. Some of them were really extremely competent. Some were great. Some were not competent yeah. at all. I mean, there was a minority that were competent, but they were they, those guys really stood out. They really were. Uh, I mean, some of the core commanders and so forth were were were, were fine fine people, but the corruption was 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 also very widespread. I mean, I ran into it personally. Um, uh, for example, a lot of uh, one of my the, the the religious groups in Vietnam, Catholics, Buddhists. And these indigenous religions called mm -hmm. the Cao Dai and the Hua right. Hao, in, and in many ways they function like political parties. The political parties were a joke; mm -hmm. they had no significance. But the religious groups were important parts of the civil society, important interest groups. And they had important political weight in the South, and so um, we sort of cultivated good relations with them in order to understand how they felt, to try to influence them at times when we wanted to. But uh, I followed the Catholics closely, mm -hmm. and I also followed the Cao Dai. Mm -hmm. And the Cao Dai um, was this unusual religion that only exists in Vietnam. And it was headquartered, centered up in Tay Ninh province that bordered Cam uh, Cambodia. Mm -hmm. It was about a, you know, an hour and a half drive north uh, west of Saigon. So I spent a lot of time out there. and. Uh, we came to understand from intelligence that um, the province chief, who was the two governments representative there, I think right. you know, the sort of the guy, the governor, effectively, right. was uh, selling uh, ammunition to the to the VC, and the VC was very close. Mm. There was this, there there still is this mountain right there called Nui Ba Deng, mm -hmm. Black Lady Mountain, uh -huh. and. Um, it stands out because there isn't much that stands. There aren't, there aren't a lot of mountains in that part of Vietnam, <laughs> and um, the 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 Viet Cong always controlled the, the mountain, mm. and at least the top of the mountain, or maybe the middle rung or something. Sometimes you know, sometimes it's like a donut, but um, uh, so they were close by, and the province chief was uh, was selling them stuff, you know, lining his own pocket. So, uh, uh, which. Um, you know the fact that we knew that, and we worried that he might know that he that we knew that. Sometimes made me a little nervous when I stayed in his quarters at night when I visited there. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> worried about an accident on the way back or something. An it, accident, right? Yeah, it didn't happen, fortunately. So. Uh, um, I, I I was always skeptical about some of those province chiefs too. They were usually like a colonel or above. Right. And um, I remember in the Philippines, when Marcos was president, he had province chiefs, too. And they were in charge of shaking down the province right. and then sending money to Manila, to Marcos, and also pocketing a reasonable yeah. percentage. Is it your understanding that province chiefs in Vietnam work like that? Yeah, a lot of it worked that way. Yeah, that's my, yeah. my, my take as well. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned bombing and, uh, and also the mining of hydrogen. Yeah, we Harbor. talked about that. But, um, uh, during the break there. I, uh, well, I, I had a very odd uh, assignment at the very end of my tour, first tour in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. After the Paris Peace Agreement, one of the annexes of the agreement was that we would clear the mines, the U.S. Navy would clear the mines in Haiphong Harbor and in the inland waterways. Mm 
And when the Navy saw this, somebody didn't really show it to the Navy when they negotiated this, because the Navy said, we don't, we don't remove mines. We'll sweep and declare them dead. That's all we can do. So we had to renegotiate the whole thing. And um, I was, um, along with another guy, because we spoke good Vietnamese, there were six of us, actually, in, in, in three teams. And I, I was with this another guy up there for three weeks in Haiphong. Uh, as the interpreter, and then we stayed in the hotel while the, uh, in Haiphong while the Navy was at, on ship, and they mm -hmm. would come in every day. And so we were sort of the liaison people on the ground also, <clears throat> working things out with the Vietnamese Navy. And it was very clear that it was the mining of Haiphong Harbor that really paralyzed them, mm -hmm. really, really hurt them, and got the North Vietnamese to finally agree to the Paris Peace Agreement. And I think the history historical research will bear that out. And it would seem to have more effect and get their attention more than the than all the all the bombing that we did. You know, generally think speaking We should have we should have done we should have done the mining earlier. Yeah. It I, it's hard to understand. I in, in this comes out a bit in the uh, Burns uh, series about mm -hmm. Vietnam how they I don't know Nixon was reluctant to do the mining because of how it would have how the Soviets would react and so forth, all of that, in retrospect, was, was, was foolish to worry about. We should have done it much earlier. The bombing was generally ineffective, wasn't it? I, I'm, it didn't seem to, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't seem to be as effective as, as the mining had been. Right. Yeah. I, I remember revisiting Vietnam, you know, in 2000, going through the Coochie underground mm -hmm. town, should we call it? And, and people, with Vietnamese would just go down there, down all the way, and yeah. the bombing was over, and it was over, just come out, and like nothing had happened. Well, a lot of uh, students of warfare you know, feel that bombing just makes people angry and more determined. Mm. So. Mm. I, I saw a lot of the bombing. I could see a lot. Of, when I went to Haiphong in 1973, it was, of course, right after the Nixon's Christmas bombing mm -hmm. in, in, at the end of 72. I could see the damage. I would say that, that most of it looked pretty well targeted mm -hmm. toward port facilities and factories. I mean, there was one square block that looked like it had been a residential place that had been hit, hit by mistake, but... Uh, Collateral damage. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, and of course that... That happens. Angers people. <laughs> I can remember seeing uh, B-52s flying, and then they would drop their bombs, and they would kind of like jump up as they yeah. dropped the bombs. It would, you know, <laughs> they had less weight, so they would kind of go up in the wow. air, just yeah, like they a were bouncing big, ball. Big bombs, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. well, you know, there, there was lots of programs to help stabilize the situation. We talked a little bit about the Strategic uh, Hamlet program, which came real early in, um, in the uh, during the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. But also, Richard Nixon was really a big promoter of Vietnamization. Right. And what's your take on that? Well, Vietnamization was, a gen it was partly, partly a genuine strategy that made sense to mm -hmm. prepare the Vietnamese to defend themselves better. Right. It was also uh, an exit, uh, exit ramp right, for right, us, right, obviously. Right, right, right. So. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem to work very it well. It didn't work very well. And there were some big tests of Vietnamization that took place while I was there, because those were the years leading right up to our withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And the Vietnamese uh, attempted um, some, the Vietnamese military attempted some major operations uh, going into Laos. There's something that was called Lam Son 19, I think, mm -hmm. was the name of the operation. Mm -hmm. They went into Laos. and. Uh, they 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 got you know they they were hit hit pretty hard. Mm -hmm. They they didn't real they didn't succeed. I remember those, when, those were bad signs. Right. I remember when there was the invasion of Cambodia uh, by U.S. and South Vietnamese right. forces. That didn't go well at all, and it set off big demonstrations in the U.S., Kent State, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean I'm not sure as, as to whether it was a useful or effective militarily. I'm, maybe it was. I'm not sure. It may, it may, I mean, I, I can sort of see the logic of why we did that in some ways. Mm -hmm. I can but, understand that. But from a purely military point of view. Right. But yes, it set off all kinds of uh, big demonstrations because it looked like we were just widening the war. So, right. Yeah. Right. Well, 
And um, then we also had the collapse of the uh, of the CNO uh, government that right. took place um, just after that. Right. And um, Long Nall came to power, and he was he was more ineffective than even the Vietnamese leaders. <laughs> so that's really saying something. Right, 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 right. I remember interviewing him uh, here in Hawaii when I was a graduate student oh, at wow. UH. And uh, I interviewed him the day that the Vietnamese came crashing into Vietnam, uh, or into Cambodia. So it was, my, my timing was real good. Yeah. Oh, you mean with that Hun Sen and the... And the well, right, yeah, so right. The, yeah, the, yeah. And, and it's interesting enough, here he was, you know, um, a person that's probably not very well liked by a lot of people <laughs> in Cambodia. He's living in this little farmhouse out in Wainai. Uh, really? And there's no security around. He just had a son and a wife wow. there. And I was really shocked. I said, well, aren't you you know, fearful of your security? <laughs> no, no problem. And I was just totally in shock. That's interesting. Yeah, totally yeah. in shock. Um, well, how about some of the leadership of Vietnam? Now, I, I think, as we were talking uh, before the show, uh, Wing Cao Ki, Wing Van Tu. Wing Cao Ki was pretty much out of the picture during your time there. Right. He was. He was still around. Mm -hmm. He was still looking flamboyant, and mm -hmm. his wife was looking flamboyant. And mm -hmm. but uh, she was always uh, kind of hot. Yeah, she was. But uh, they were not. Um, but he was not a political figure uh, mm -hmm. of, of great importance during that period. I mean, I guess he was vice president at the beginning, but he really didn't have any power. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Well, let me. Uh, we, I, I've just been informed that we're just down to the last minute and a half here. But yeah. let me squeeze in this question. What about the North Vietnamese leadership, the balance between Ho Chi Minh and Lee Duan? And Lei Zuan, yeah. Lei Duan. Well, and Lei Zuan really, um, by the time I was at Lei Zuan, well, Ho Chi Minh had died, of course, but, <laughs> right, but right. Uh, I think he died in 69, I think. Yeah. Right. But um, Lei Zuan was, uh, had taken over, and he was a real hardliner. Mm -hmm. He was a Leninist Leninist, and uh, he was. Um, you know, he led them to, to victory, really, along with, uh, of course, General Ziap, mm -hmm. who I met several times, actually, mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. I was there. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Some people have said if, if uh, Ho Chi Minh had lived longer and perhaps Le, Le Duan had died, it, it, it would have been a more amiable conclusion to the war. I, that Ho Chi Minh was more flexible. I, you doubt that? I doubt that. I really <laughs> okay. doubt that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Faint hopes there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, looking back on, this is maybe a little unfair question to ask you with like one minute or 45 seconds <laughs> left, but looking back on Vietnam, uh, do, do we sort of disregard anything that we learned in Vietnam at the uh, time we got involved in Iraq? I think... Um, the first lesson I mentioned, looking carefully at who, who, are, who are your local allies? How much support do they have? Um, you know, the, the move we made in which we, 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 we destroyed the sort of Sunni structure there, okay. including the, the military, uh, was in retrospect, and even at the time, was really a mistake. I think we're going to have to stop yeah. here. Okay, well, thank <laughs> you very much for watching Asia in Review. We've had a really great discussion with Ambassador Burkhardt today. Uh, as we mentioned, this is the 43rd year since the um, government of the Republic of Vietnam collapsed, and uh, so we wanted to take note of that on our show today. Our show was uh, Vietnam War, Lessons Learned, Lessons Ignored. We'll see you next week.